What's up guys, hope everyone is doing well. In this video I'm going to be going over a number of updates for Bitcoin. I'm going to go over some analysis for the total crypto market cap, also SPX and gold, and then provide some other commentary on things relative. Um, but to go ahead and get it started here, the first thing that I want to go over is an update. So I just found out within the last two weeks that about 11, 12 months ago, there was an update to one of the main indicators that I use. Um, which is the Trader's Reality Indicator. It's now under the name right here, down at the bottom, Trader's Reality Main, made by Trader's Reality. So what you see here currently on the chart, the white candles, the black candles, the yellow, purple, um, the green, so all the color-coded candles, and the, the estimated moving averages, these black boxes, this is all part of the indicator. It's a hybrid indicator. There's, various things that you can utilize on the indicator. These are the main three things. Well, really, these are the only three things that I use um, when it comes to the various tools that this indicator provides. But this is how I specifically personalized it color-wise, just, just to fit my taste. But if you were to be using it for the first time, this right here is what it's going to look like. So we go into the indicator here. The vector candles and the EMAs right here, right off the bat, you see those are the two of the things that I use and then this newly, uh, really the main thing that was added for the update was this show the vector or volume, if you will, control zones because the vector candles are volume based uh, vector candles or the VCZ. Um, again, like I said, so this is creating zones. You can look at them as a quiddity zone in a type of way, but they're just zones of uh, vector based volume that are going to be uh, Printed in tandem with the vector candles themselves. So again, we have red, green, violet, and blue. If you are using the default settings, um, the red, in my case, is black. Uh, for green, I used white. For violet, I actually used the color violet. And then for blue, I used yellow. And then I just made the up and so this is like normal, typical up candles or down candles. I just made them typically what they are. So up being green and then down being red um, for my personal settings. But anyways, the red or the black candle is going to represent uh, high selling volume, so that's 200% or more. The green is just going to be the opposite of that. Again, like I said, it's a white in my case. This is going to be 200% or more by volume, so high by volume there. Violet's going to be, or pink is going to be 150% sell volume. It's going to be above average. Uh, and then blue is going to be 150% uh, by volume. So we have red and green are high volume vector candles, and then violet and blue are above average volume vector candles. So it's 200% for the first two, 150% or less. So 200% or more, and then 150% or less. And then, like I said, so the gray and the black in this case are just the no uh, specified volume content that's notable of being printed as a vector. Then we have the estimated moving averages, the 5, the 13, the 50, the 200, and the 800 on here. So if we go back to my personal settings, the other main thing to demonstrate here is I'm going to use this portion of the price right here for Bitcoin. So what we see here is the bear market from 2013 leading into 2015, and then the bull market leading into 2017 and approximately 20,000. This portion right here in price, this is phase two of cycle two for Bitcoin's overall historical uh, price development according to my phase cycle theory. If you're new to the content or you're not familiar, I'll have cards linked at the beginning of this video that um, have me more elaborately going over what I mean by uh, cycles and phases in my uh, specific system. But what we see here is this massive white volume 
vector candle 200 percent or more uh, like i said it's going this would be green if you're using the normal traditional version we came down and we recovered nearly 100 percent of that vector candle and then we went up printed another white vector candle right here with this downside in august we recovered it so the rule of thumb is and we'll really see that here that 50 percent or more of the vector Candles need to be reclaimed. So if you think about it as a volume control zone, vector control zone, also for the market makers, which is really what this indicator, and I guess I suppose a philosophical sense, uh, is oriented around. Uh, uh, so like, for example, if you're buying on any exchange, like Binance, Coinbase, Kraken, whatever, when you buy through these people, they have a certain people that work for them, market makers that are putting in all of the orders that the, you know, Coinbase, Binance as an exchange or company, et cetera, or you know, all the buys and the sells, the longs, the shorts, et cetera, that they're getting. All those have to be put in according to the market makers, the people that are making the calls when it comes to the overall pool of liquidity, what's coming in and out of a market. And these volume zones are meant to pick up on the motives, um, uh, directions, whatever, like, which is why the BNB vector candles direction the price where it's going according to the people that so called uh, make the market or market makers. Now, what we can see here is if I take a box from the wick high, the last vector down to, and there's six total white vectors here, we're going to ignore the yellow and the purple for this video, but just focusing on the high volume vectors so white and black we can see here like i said so we have six white vectors and we can see that the price came all the way down to the roughly halfway through the entire candle that is the third or the well starting from the beginning the fourth candle so right here and we can also looking at this blue box whenever this black begins we can see here that over 50 percent of this entire vector zone being the blue zone was recovered um, which met the criteria for the bear market to end. I mean, it could have gone all the way down to the very bottom of this blue box and recovered 100% of this, uh, these, the zone, these six candles, these six high volume candles make up. But like I said, approximately 50% or more, uh, at least 50% needs to be recovered. If we look at these two white vectors, these are only two candles that right here that we haven't already recovered. Like for example, in the March crash, Bitcoin could have gone back below 3,100. It could have gone all the way down to uh, 1.1,000. I mean, if we zoom out even more, I mean, technically in a sense, if it wanted to, if it was meant to be, it could have gone all the way down to this liquidity or this volume zone down here at $472. But obviously that didn't happen and it happened for a specific reason, but Anyways, we can see that the March crash over and compensated for these two vector candles. It wicked far lower than this first vector candle. But if we look at the body, it basically was around a little past halfway into that volume control zone. If we go to most recently, these are the two vector candles right here that we need to be looking at with respect to this bear market. You can see that we've recovered essentially the entirety of that zone going from this wick all the way down to the... Uh, portion of the uh, this zone down here that we went down to at 15.4 thousand that wasn't recovered so on the flip side if you haven't already picked up by now when you are at the end of a bull market and then you're leading into a bear market uh, the bear market needs to recover at least 50 percent or more of the prior white vector candles that have not been reclaimed or recovered so on the flip side when you're transitioning from a bear market into a bull market it flips into the black vector candles, which are going to be these right here. So if I take away that bubble and draw a box again from the top of this candle down to this right here represented the entire, well, we'll include this purple one for now. So this, this represents the entire, actually no, we'll just, we'll stick to just the black ones, like I said earlier. So this entire, this high volume zone right here was created. You can see that we have already Diminish this black box almost all the way. That means we've recovered most of the volume control zone. So here on this monthly chart, when you start to see the price closing above, especially then closing above this, so 43,000, and then opening candles above 43,000, this entire liquidity or uh, volume control zone is going to have been 
going to be taken out and will be one of the final things in uh, seeing Bitcoin continue to move higher here, higher than it already has been. It's been looking great the last few weeks, but seeing it close above that and then obviously moving back above 69,000 being approximately 69,000 being the all-time high will be. Obviously, that's going to be the final thing to confirm the fact that Bitcoin is in a general bull market and going to make new all-time highs overall. But just to quickly go back, each of these bubbles is showing how every single wick in terms of the phase cyclical structure of my, my theory for why Bitcoin has moved the way it has since it came out back in 2009. Each of these uh, structural uh, points throughout the cycles came down in this one right here and wicked each of these right here each of these liquidity zones I mean even this one back here is the first one which doesn't really pertain to what I was talking about in terms of the phase cycles but this one also is just a major wick and it came down right to the very top of that liquidity zone um, now clearly these were just uh, it's not necessarily that it came down to the top of that there was a liquidity zone as I mentioned Keep saying liquidity i should be saying volume but anyways the volume zone all the way down to basically right here if you just want to count the bodies of the candles there's a volume zone right here and you can see we came down and we reclaimed more than 50 percent or like i said just at least 50 percent so it's really that the candles are pushing or diminishing this box down from beginning up here down to this point it's not as if that box is already there uh, at this size and then the candles came down and hit it but anyways the, the point is that these vector control zones again like I said along with the vector candles so far here on this monthly chart this is the index chart has all the data you could ask for is shown where the bottoms have been each and every single time in terms of the phase cyclical structure that I've gone over um, for this channel another one of the main things here on the higher time frame to see on this monthly chart it's Large size you can see is already peaked above the 50. It's an actually at 64.73. This is going to be the median of the highs and lows of this RSI that it's set so far um, over this pretty much entire uh, period of time Bitcoin's been out. Uh, so this is also one of the last things to see. You can see going back to all the way back here, 2012, 2016, and right here in 2020. Um, was one of the final things that represented seeing Bitcoin uh, move into the next or the upcoming um, bull market after seeing a bear to bull transition. So moving into more of the actual updates for Bitcoin. Here on this daily chart, this should look familiar. This layout should look familiar to those of you who keep up with the content. But we've had, we had it, we were, Bitcoin's been in a macro falling wedge going all the way back to January 2021. It retested this macro falling wedge. This orange line was the resistance of that macro falling wedge. It retested it back in March of 2023. We've just been moving sideways as I've been updating this entire time between 25 to 30,000. We then recently in this sideways action broke this second shorter time frame resistance, which was very similar as I was pointing out in past videos to this first resistance clearly right here. So once we broke that and we came down and we tested 26, the wick was at 26, 26,554, I was saying 264, 265 back then would have been a value to look out for. It met that criteria. Ever since then, we have Bitcoin has come up to a range of 35 to, to basically, so basically 35 to 38,000 are the two local highs the Bitcoin has set recently. Um, on top of that, as I was mentioning, like this entire, so we broke out of this macro falling wedge. We had a bear to bull uptrend transition right here. And the RSI was doing the exact opposite. It was moving in a, in a downtrend. We had bearish divergence, so it's bullish divergence, which again, is one of the reasons why I was saying that this trend, this uptrend was going to continue and make higher highs and not break down. So far we're seeing, if we zoom in here, that the RSI throughout this entire time that Bitcoin has broken up here recently, going back to around the 17th of October. This entire time, the Bitcoin, similar to this longer term uptrend that I just went over not too long ago, the shorter term uptrend right here, you can see higher highs, higher lows, whereas the RSI is in a downtrend here as well, retesting this longer time frame resistance 
um, that was again seeing uh, another a similar structure here with bullish or uh, hidden bullish divergence and bearish divergence could likely be signaling signaling the the continuation of this uptrend we've been seeing here especially with the fact that we are if I go down to the four hour you can see that in this ascending channel we've been in with this resistance being laid out right here we've already broken above it now we're retesting it um, so we could very likely see Bitcoin kind of make this a double bottom type formation here and continue to go higher up towards the forty to fifty thousand dollar range as I've been mentioning for a number of weeks if not multiple months at this point um, but lastly is if we go back to the period of time leading into the most recent bull market so starting at March going all the way to right here to September this is what I believe that range of time I believe we're going to see a bull market highly similar to that as I've been uh, pointing out a lot recently this area right here would coincide with the support or the resistance of the sideways so this right here for all intents and purposes Bitcoin hit 31,000 for the second time right here it came down leading into September October November and then Bitcoin started to break above right here 31,000 again and you can see that price right here after it broke back in 2020 which again like I said I'm comparing it to what we've seen recently you can see how the price was just building up over a rough period of about 14 15 16 bars it's keeping in mind this kind of upwards consolidation we go to recently we can see something very similar like I was saying we broke this 31,000 coincided with what I was mentioning in the past then we're seeing the price is upwards consolidation right here it's also similar time frame it's a little bit longer but we're seeing 14 15 16 17 bars and we're breaking out of this ascending structure we're in um, which again further confirms seeing price move into forty to fifty thousand um, dollars. Taking it to this two-day chart right here, we see this massive macro W, which again is according to phase one of my cycle theory for Bitcoin. This double bottom set the precedent for this ABC move we're seeing. We've uh, met the first high at A. We've come down. We've met the bear market bottom at B. If we zoom in here, we can see that if we look here at this black dotted this ascending trend line was a support for the brunt of this uptrend we have been seeing here as I was going over as we were leading in August best case scenario would have been that we bounced off of this trend line and continued a more strong less deadening uptrend but clearly we broke below um, we then early on in this drop we had this you can see here this pretty substantial major wick and I was saying that price is likely just continue to drift slightly downwards and fulfill this wick a little bit more price then did do that as i was going over we've already broken above the sideways range about 31.8 and now we are within the last four days we can see up here that the price has closed one candle above this trend line and has essentially opened the current candle above it this current candle will likely close above it as well and then the next one will more fully open above it. So far, this fractal pattern that is as up to date as I can get it for my uh, specific cyclical projection is lining up pretty accurately. Uh, according to this, by the end of November, we should be up to around 45, 47, pushing 50,000. Um, like I was saying, I think just in general, by the end of this year, Bitcoin will have solidly pushed into the range. 40 to 50,000 and then we'll start to see some sort of bull market similar to this a quick one leading into the halving next year where I think we'll see Bitcoin top out with respect to contrary to how the previous halvings have occurred and then again all of this my price range 180,000 to 250,000 at the highest lines up with the historical Fibonacci tracement each Bitcoin um, phase or cyclical high has met um, which takes me to, I'll go over these two charts first. So right here we see the two week chart going all the way back to the very first so phase one of cycle two for Bitcoin. You can see cycle or phase one of cycle one met the fib range I was mentioning. We then see the bear market of phase two, 
which I already touched on earlier, met the same exact Fibonacci range. Again, go to phase one of cycle three right here. We have yet to meet that, but we can see that 64 to 69,000 met the 1.5 to 1.618, just as price did back in April 2013, meeting 1.5 to 1.618 after this phase one W. Again, this area back here is phase one. So the phase one W leading into the ABCD pattern of cycle two for Bitcoin. And then starting right here, this W leading into what we've seen so far up to current time is phase one for cycle three of Bitcoin. And now we are just waiting for price to hit the 2.186 range up to the 2.382. Again, approximately 180,000 to 250,000. I think a sweet spot of approximately 220,000, give or take about $7,000 is more likely where Bitcoin will top out with respect to. Um, and I believe, like I've been saying, it's going to be a quick bull run given where we are at in the, uh, the cyclical structure being in phase one towards the latter portion of phase one. We're going to see a breakout, very uh, parabolic, like I said. So basically, we're going to see something similar to this area back here, September 2020, all the way up to around April 2021. Again, like I said, I've been talking about a lot recently it's happening again also at the same time September October November as it did in 2020 just three years later um, to update this if you want to interpret this sideways action we saw and it actually looks better here on the three-week chart interpret this if you would like to interpret this as a bull flag you can see that this also this is another thing that creates um, price going to at highest around 50 approximately fifty thousand dollars maybe seeing some mix up to like 53 54 thousand at highest but like i said in general 40 to 50 thousand seems to and we're already you know we've pretty much roughly already met the the forty thousand dollar requirement given that price has already hit essentially thirty eight thousand at this point um but outside of that the main thing for so this two week chart if i take everything off so i went over the vector candles earlier on that monthly chart which are going to be all these, like I said. So we see the white candles, the black candles, the purple candles, the yellow candles. These are just high and above average volume vector candles. The um, the green and the red are just normal normal candles. And then these, so the pink and the turquoise candles. These are RSI based vector candles. But what we'll see here is we see zooming in. We see this purple candle right here. This is a bearish divergence vector candle printed with respect to the RSI down here. We then see this blue one right here. This is a bullish divergence printed with respect to the RSI down here. On the two-week chart, this perfectly aligned up with the bull market or the bear market uh, lining up when it began after the all-time high at 69,000. In terms of uh, price highs, the bear market began back here at 69,000 down to 15.4 thousand. But when you look at on-chain data and really cyclically speaking, the the bear market began back here at 69,000, which um, would be one of the reasons why the pie cycle indicator occurs right there as well. Um, but if we go all the way back to 2014, 2015, we see another bearish divergence candle printed right here after the bull market uh, highs were set. And we didn't see any bullish vectors right here, bullish divergence vectors printed here in these lows, but and so this is the two weekly. If we move into the three week, basically all of the candles that we weren't finding here on this two week chart get filled in with this three week chart. So we still see our bullish vector candle right here in December 2022, most recently. We don't see the bearish one, but the two weekly chart had the bearish one right here. Um, the three week chart fills in the bearish one for the 2018 bear market. And then we get this bullish vector candle uh, this bullish divergence vector candle were printed right here after the market crash in 2020. If we go back down here we again we see the same bearish divergence vector we saw in the two-week chart but then we see zooming down here to the 14 2014 2015 bear market low we see there is a blue vector right here and a blue vector right here two bullish divergence candles printed in those lows to then see that bear market actually then come to uh, its overall finality. And then lastly, if you just didn't already pick up on it, we're seeing very similar uh, temporal confluences. You can see from top to bottom, 21 bars, 21 bars, 21 bars. And then the bear market from 2013 to 2015 
uh, structurally speaking, is highly similar to 24,000 out of 15.4,000, which is why we see uh, it carry on out to uh, from top to the very end of this bear market going sideways, 34 bars. And then we see the same thing done right here most recently um, as well, leading into the flipping uh, into a bull market after some sort of transition. Uh, so to move on to this chart, uh, this is one of the main charts for this video. Uh, I posted it on my community tab about a week ago. Uh, I don't know if the cross had happened just yet, but I first made this chart maybe two weeks ago or so, and this final cross right here, which is what lines up with each of these vertical lines with the turquoise dots here on the ASO, the average sentiment oscillator, basically it just converts the data of price comparing the sentiments of bearishness and bullishness to create this oscillating indicator that whenever the white flips above the black and steadily stays above the median line right here, uh, roughly basically 50 on the dot, uh, you can see right here clearly that's bull market territory. We're seeing the average sentiment oscillator flip into a bullish sentiment, whereas right here when we see the black flip above here, above 50, we see the bear market ensue for Bitcoin. Now going all the way back to February of 2014, this was the first, um, in this bear market, this is the first bearish cross that we see on the on the ASO. And then starting off from here as one, we count all of the crossings we see, we go one, two, three, four, five, six, and on the sixth cross, the final bullish flip on the indicator, the bull market began, this happened in, October, the second pink dot, the first bearish indicator. Again, the first one was in February of 2014. The second one has happened in February 2018. We then count forward. So one, two, three, four, five. And on the sixth cross, turquoise dot, vertical line, we see the bull market ensue after the March crash. And then we come to our third pink dot happening in May of 2021. We then carry the sun out. One, two, three, four, five. Sixth cross, we get our turquoise dot, the vertical line. Um, and this happened on the week of the 30th last month. So it happened sometime within the 23rd to the 30th of October. We got this sixth and final bullish cross that has acted as a very uh, reliable indicator going all the way back to, like I said, February 2014. The first two pink dots are bearish crossings, both happened in February. And the first bullish, or the so the first sixth cross in 2015 happened in October, and the third sixth cross also happened in October as well. So seeing a number of confluences there. Um, outside of that, the main thing I wanted to update here is this MACD. I have been going over this MACD corresponds to price from basically when so when the, when the macro falling wedge began in January 2021 that I was going. I was talking about on the daily chart is when this symmetrical triangle started to form here on this MACD uh, with Bollinger Bands paired with it. Now I've been going over this, oh it's almost perfect, this almost perfectly symmetrical triangle going back to at least June, July, August um, of last year uh, because uh, fairly you can see this, these two tops right here and these two bottoms right here are what form this triangle and we finally we saw we well, first of all we saw the retracement into this yellow zone that I circled some time ago that I don't I don't exactly remember when but I was circling this as an area to come down to if we start to significantly break below this it's not going to be good so far we came down to that we bounced and then last when I checked this not too long ago we've seen this significant break above um, this this very long term again it's almost two years long uh, convergent triangle here for the the MACD or the momentum of price we saw something. Not a symmetrical, but something similar back here where we get the final break above and we see volatility, momentum, volume in general increase. Um, I mean, if, even if we go down here, if we look here at the RVI, the relative velocity index is finally peaking its head back above the upper bound at 80. Last time this happened, uh, takes us all the way back to, again, November 2020, like I already pointed out many lower time frame and other chart similarities between that in terms of the cyclical structure that I talk about. In pretty much every single video 
And even if we look at the Bollinger Bands throughout Bitcoin's entire history, we were leading into the most recent retracement we saw in August um, of this year. The Bollinger Bands were compressed uh, as much as they have been in history, only uh, tied with going back to April 2016. So... This area right here, April 2016, and then this area right here currently, these were the two most, in terms of the Bollinger Bands, compressed points in time in both of them. At least for this first one, this was a bullish indicator, and the second one, it looks very similar to this one as well in, in, in many regards, uh, and things that I've touched on and gone over on other charts. Um, but lastly, I just I want to quickly go over this, this RSI. We can see here that... If I zoom in here, I first went over this chart. The RSI was somewhere, yeah, I'll highlight it, somewhere within this general purple area right here. And I was mentioning how we see a curved linear trend, the red and the green line, or curved linear line. And then we see the linear trend, the white line. Uh, we came down and we, in a confluential manner, we bottomed on the white line, the linear line, and the curved linear green support at the exact same time. We then bounced. Upon that, came up to the median at 52.53, slightly broke above the resistance. The curved linear resistance came down, and we retested the curved linear resistance almost precisely. We then broke above the linear, and now we are really just waiting for the RSI to break into around 90 to 100 to see something similar to how we, like I said, going back to November of 2020. It's again essentially roughly just a different indicator. I'm essentially pointing out the same thing I did here on the RVI, the relative velocity index, but now it's just the relative strength index for the RSI. Um, outside of that, so here we see another monthly chart. Each of these encircled zones represent the crossing back over of the white and black moving averages above the, the purple moving averages. This is uh, a set of estimated moving averages and moving averages. So the white moving average is the 7MA and the black moving average is a 10 and the purple estimated moving average is a 14. And zooming in here you can see that we got the cross, the bearish crossing right here. Really after the, the low had been set we were having a bear to bull transition but we really start to see this further in Bitcoin's aging and maturity right here during the bear market of phase two and cycle two for Bitcoin. We see the white and the black ultimately cross below the purple, then they cross back above. No new lows are set. We saw no more bearish crossings. Fast forward 2018, 2019, we see bearish flip right here leading into the lows. We see a bullish flip right here. No more bearish flips were seen in price, albeit the crazy wick of March of 2020. Uh, no, no new lows were made below approximately 3.1 thousand. And then most recently we saw, again, we saw a bearish flip leading into the lows. We have seen the bullish flip in its entirety with white going above the purple and the black going above the purple moving average as well. So this, historically speaking, um, not just because a lot of these things I go over in these videos really only apply to going back to 2014 and, and, and onward. So after price hitting over $1,000. But this, these, this moving average, these three moving averages, this trio is something that is accurate going all the way back to really the first uh, phase or first period of time in Bitcoin history where on the higher time frame started to notice the cyclical uh, structure of Bitcoin's price because before this it was literally just straight up can't really deduce much in terms unless you were to go lower time frames of what's really going on in this what almost straight up movement um, so to me this confirms that even if you know let's go up here again this this turquoise pattern is something I think we're going to see something similar to this uh, according to my phase cycle theory the 180 250 thousand but I mean we could see something let's say we move a little bit higher into the halving and we come back down and do something like this, and we come back up, and we move into 2025, or maybe even 2026. Like, I I, I don't personally think Bitcoin is going to take longer than 2025 in general to top out for the next bull market high. But, I mean, we could be seeing, you know, price move up into 
January, February of next year, maybe gets rejected at 45, 50,000, and then comes down, it's 22, 23, and then bounces and then starts to go up something along these lines. Um, but regardless of whatever happens, I don't think that there's any good reason to think that Bitcoin is going to go back below 15.4 thousand or touch, you know, 12 to 10,000, like plenty of people who are still interpreting that and just kind of telling their followers to, to just wait on, you know, 10, 12, 9,000 because Bitcoin hasn't actually bottomed out yet, despite all the things that are saying that it is more than likely bottomed out than not. And at this point, almost full, uh, fully confirmed. Um, here for this this uh, this monthly RSI with the, the, the descending channel, you can see here that the RSI finally broke into this white range. If we go back to past history, when that happened in 2012, you see the bull market already began. Back here, 2016, the bull market had already began. Uh, if we go right here, May of 2019, the bull market already began. We had the crash into March of 2020, but like I said, no new lows were made. So essentially the bull market had began. And then if we go to August, September 2020, when it happened again, the bull market then really began leading into 64 and 69,000. And we've seen the same thing right here with the RSI crossing into 60 to around 65 for the uh, fifth time in its history, going all the way back to, like I said, 2012. Again, further confirming the moving averages as well. So here we see the total crypto market cap. Now, I think that approximately 10 to 20 trillion is feasible by the end of 2025. More specifically, I think 15 to 17,000, or no, 15 to 17 trillion. According to my phase cycle theory and projecting that on this chart, it would be something similar to this. Uh, we're just going to see a very quick and rapid bull run for the crypto market. Uh, and then price wise, like I said, I think 15 to 17 trillion is a sweet spot. And then I'd say around 10 to 12 is a low, lower bound. And then around 18 to 20 trillion is a is a is an upper or higher bound if things overextend higher than what I think uh, or what I what I, what I see is uh, possibly happening. Now, some of you may be thinking this is far too much, especially you know, let's just say 15 to 20 trillion is far too much, you know. Approximately 10, you know, 8 to 10 trillion makes, you know, good sense. Prior to this, 3 trillion was the highest, you know, just seeing a double would put us at 6, 7, you know, pushing 8 trillion at the highest. Maybe that seems more feasible to you. Um, but one of the things I do want to bring up uh, parallel to this is the fact, so the Bitcoin ETFs and how much news has been revolving around that. The ETF for Bitcoin, the exchange tradable fund. It's been something that has been very uh, important within, you know, the Bitcoin space and crypto space going all the way back to around 2017, give or take a year or so. Um, but now it really seems that uh, the, the institutional interest is ramping up and is actually already there and has been there for at least around a year, maybe a year and a half. Um, part of me just has a hard time believing that BlackRock or Fidelity, any of the, the institutions or firms listed here on this image, weren't buying Bitcoin when it was at like 15, 16, 17,000. I have a hard time believing, and obviously I, I could be wrong, but I have a hard time believing that we're seeing BlackRock, Fidelity, etc. just really starting to buy now uh, when Bitcoin was more so around like at lowest 25,000. That definitely could be the case, but anyways, so um, when it comes to all the institutional firms that have applied for uh, the SEC is reviewing their their applications for having a Bitcoin ETF. As we can see down here at the bottom, it's approximately 20, 27.2 trillion assets are under management when it comes to all these ETF applications. When it comes to, as I mentioned um, back here on, well, let me see this chart. Back here on this chart, like I said, 180,000 to 250,000 was I think is likely now. If out of all these assets, approximately 15% goes into Bitcoin, then that will bring Bitcoin up to the range of 180 to 250,000. 
Now deviating a little bit higher than 15% is going to push it towards 250,000. Deviating a little bit lower than 15% is going to be close to 180,000. And it's that's only um, roughly around three point three to three and a half trillion dollars that would need to go into Bitcoin right now, uh, pushing forward to the highest. That would need to go into Bitcoin right now in order to push it to, like I said, 180, well, 250,000. Bitcoin at 250,000 is going to be worth around 4.3 trillion. So 180,000 is around, I think, 3.3 to 3.5 trillion. Now, realistically, I mean, even BlackRock's got 9 trillion assets under management. Fidelity has 4.24, and JP uh, Morgan has 3.3 trillion. Now, JP Morgan could put everything to have, which obviously that's not likely in a Bitcoin, and it would essentially meet my range. Fidelity could, and and especially BlackRock. If BlackRock, for whatever reason, whoever, you know, the assets they manage it, for whatever reason, all of that goes to Bitcoin, then it would take it far higher than 250000 But, I mean, even if just 40 to 50% of BlackRock, the assets that they manage goes into Bitcoin, it will meet that range. But more likely, obviously, it's going to be some sort of specific composition of a percentage of BlackRock, Fidelity, JP Morgan, whatever ETF applications that get um, approved. It'll be a specific percentage from each of these uh, different ETFs that is going to push Bitcoin up to uh, at least over 100, but around 180,000, 250,000. Um, generally speaking, like I said before, 2025. Um, so like I said, I mean, when it comes to the, for Bitcoin, like I said, 15%, practically 15% of 27.2 trillion, but when it comes to 10 to 20 uh, trillion, uh, obviously that changes things, um, by quite a lot. So if Bitcoin were to push, let's just say we'll put a rough median at 4 trillion, that's only going to, would take, you know, things up to this purple range right here. So that's, you know, roughly half of this parabolic leap. So it would still have essentially roughly the same distance, a little bit more to go in order to reach around 10 to uh, 20 trillion. But like I said, I think 15 to 17 trillion is, uh, is a sweet spot to see. Now that's going to be seeing out of all these assets managed here, obviously. So there's 27.2 trillion in total. Um, now, Factoring this in, obviously, we're going to have some retail money go into Bitcoin along with this institutional money. Then there's also just going to be other people who are uh, more, uh, just have more money than a general retail trader or or uh, not just a retail investor, but like a professional trader, investor, etc. Things like uh, like that. But pushing 20 trillion is the reason why I think anything above 20 trillion is just really not feasible at all is because I mean even all of these institutional assets is 27.29 trillion and obviously not all of this 27 trillion dollars is going to go into it I mean if 50 percent of this so basically approximately 14 trillion goes into the entire crypto market I would be rather surprised uh, even at 50 percent so I mean I think I think reasonably speaking 30 to 50 percent um, of this going into the overall crypto market cap is going to be feasible. Uh, so if it is 15 percent, that's 14 trillion from roughly, let's just say, one trillion. So that puts it at 15 trillion. Now pushing it down to 30, 30 percent, let's just say 9, 10 trillion, that's going to put us up to 10 to 11 trillion, like I said. So 10 to 17 trillion, as a conclusion, seems to be the most likely, in my opinion. And I think, I think. You know, at it, it, it the very base case minimum, a doubling up to around six to seven trillion uh, would be most reasonable. But to move on from that, so again, kind of further playing on the ETFs, the the bullishness that we're seeing in the charts, along with this institutional interest that we're seeing, what Larry Fink has said about his investors showing concern. Uh, as he said in a video I played on the channel recently, a flight to quality in terms of just having, you know, store of value, safety, and and, and, and other things along with that. But anyways, this tweet um, by at British Hoddle, BlackRock did say they'd start seeding their Bitcoin ETF this month. This was tweeted November 9th. Seeding will probably mean 20 to 50 million, as will others, meaning the other people who've applied for ETFs. Imagine if this pump 
which went from a market cap of 735 billion yesterday to a market cap of 798 billion today. A $63 billion increase in market cap in a single day was that from the seeding process beginning. Imagine once an ETF is actually approved and starts trading, this is why you need to get one Bitcoin. Essentially just talking about the fact that, first of all, bringing up, saying that BlackRock said they would start seeding their ETF. So by seeding, just beginning to start to put money into Bitcoin to prepare for the fact that, First of all, as an exchange traded fund, whether it's BlackRock or any of the other firms that are put an application in, they need to buy a bunch of Bitcoin so they can basically, in a sense, lend it to their institutional investors. Or, for example, if I would, uh, whenever BlackRock, let's just say theoretically, BlackRock's ETF goes live and I buy some Bitcoin from them, I'm buying Bitcoin. I'm not really buying Bitcoin. I'm, I'm basically creating a contract or an agreement between myself as an investor and BlackRock saying that I would like for you to lend me, you know, five Bitcoin for this period of time that I'm just going to sell it right back to you, i.e. BlackRock at the end of the day. It's, it's somewhat similar to buying, like, for example, Bitcoin from Coinbase and their reserves or Binance and their reserves for Bitcoin. Like you're just, unless you take your Bitcoin off that, that centralized exchange and put it in some sort of cold storage wallet, then you don't actually own that Bitcoin because uh, it's still on the exchange uh, and the keys that are holding it with respect to the wallet and things like that aren't actually, it's not your own hardware device. You don't have complete control or really ownership over it, but it's even more worse and more exacerbated with it, something like an ETF, especially if it's BlackRock. Um, so here for the SPX quickly, um, now, if we go look here, towards the end of October, uh, last week of October, we saw this is when crypto began to rally, and the seven largest tech stocks lost around $300 billion in valuation uh, towards the end of last month. And we saw that happen right here with the SPX as it was going down from basically halfway into September all the way into the very end of October when it was losing that the, the, the seven, like at, at Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, uh, and a few others, the, the seven largest um, stocks on the uh, traditional markets were losing a lot of value into the end of October. And we've seen price recently. I'm not really sure why these keep getting inverted. I go back to these charts and for whatever reason, red is green and green is red. But anyways, it did it again. I don't know. Anyways, we've seen this increase right here in price. Um, and so far we've wicked, we have this volume zone that we're needing to get back above. So until we see here on this four day chart and let's just go to a weekly real quick and see, see here on the weekly, we've got more of this volume control zone recovered until we start to see one this volume control zone disappear on the weekly. And then let's, let's go down to the four day until we start to see this volume control zone disappear and candles start to close above you know at least a good 4.4 thousand i don't really think there's much reason to think that it's going to continue to go higher here for those of you familiar i do think and i've elaborated it many times uh in, in recent videos and other videos on this channel that i think the stock market's heading into a 2008 light crash i went over some data recently with respect to the m2 money supply uh, when it comes to american currency that it has done something that it hasn't done since the 1920s leading into the 1930s when the Great Depression happened and the market collapsed. So I think we're going to see the market collapse here. I think we'll continue to see, it might build up above this red resistance right here. Price might build up above a little bit, but I think ultimately this volume control zone is going to suppress price downward. And then we can see here with this, this curve linear resistance, this orange curve linear resistance that we recently locally bottomed out on it right here, going back to uh, roughly October 25th. We'll get rejected here with the resistance, the volume control zone, ultimately end up losing the curve linear uh, resistance now support, but then we'll lose that. Uh, and then ultimately, I think we will continue to see things crash down into 2025, no later than early 2026, I think. Um, 
Now, the 2008 crash, which uh, technically is cyclically, if you look at the harmonic progression of the stock SPX and NASDAQ going back to 1994, that's where we are lining up with. Uh, and that was previously a drawdown of 57%, which would take us down to 2000. Albeit, plenty of informational sources have been saying that it could likely be worse. So if we look here at this descending support was the support for this entire bear market down right here, we could see the stock market just completely jump off of a cliff and meet the $2,000 range similar to the 2008 crash and even, even be worse than that, um, like I mentioned. And also the fact that the looking at the M2 money supply, the things looking similar to building into the Great Depression, the, the the inflation and the instability of not only the American economy but the global you know supply chains uh, plenty of other things just really the entire global unrest we're seeing right now I think is really going to culminate into some sort of market collapse as I've been saying lining up with the decoupling we're going to see the SPX uh, stock market a lot of things on the stock market die off it's going to cause a crash and then things like Bitcoin and the crypto market are going to continue to go up. Look here at gold. See here with the red box. Horizontal three-year, approximately three-year resistance that has been continuing to suppress gold. If we look here at this orange resistance, this orange trend line, um, we could be seeing some type of double top here. We've already been rejected and lost. Because gold recently had a pretty major pump of 11% in terms of gold. That's pretty, it's a pretty decent move towards the upside going from 1800 all the way up to 2000, roughly $200 uh, gained there. But so far we've moved down from 2000 all the way to around 19 point, or $1,930, roughly 3% or so. And we can see here that we have a volume control zone that we could like for example um, I think gold is going to crash as well I don't really have any significant price targets for it but I just don't think over the next five to seven years gold is going to be appreciating any higher than the 2000 that it's hit so far I mean we could see something like this and we'll see one last push towards you know maybe no higher than like 2200 or so or just somewhere above this this three-year horizontal resistance that's not, you know, pushing it significantly above like 25, 2800. Um, but I think once, if gold starts to lose closed candles, you know, like the daily or higher below 1800, then that will, uh, in the shorter term at least, confirm move down towards this vector. Volume control zone at 1700 to 16. So 17, 1750 to 1650. And once that's lost, I mean, volume control zone wise, it could go all the way down to 1400. Could also find some support right here, right at around like 1600 to 1550. Um, and if we look here, we're also we're also seeing some potential bearish divergence that could further play this out. If we look here at this point, going back to the 24th, roughly, of January, connecting these right here, you can see we have an ascending structure down here as a negative structure. Uh, but I would look at that as really with kind of just somewhat of a grain of salt that kind of further confirms the overall fact that gold's been going sideways for approximately three years at this point and hasn't really shown too much interest in going significantly higher from here on out, especially considering the other chart I've gone over in past where we're seeing uh, an even higher time frame double top. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on this too much in this video, but going over how we're seeing this area right here from August 2011 to January 2013 looks very similar, very, very similar to August of 2020 leading into January 2024. In many many different areas time wise the harmonic structure price wise it all looks seeing bearish divergences etc it all looks very similar and I think we are going to at least see price move down to this uh, rough range right here from around 1400 to 1200 uh, over the next you know three five seven years or so just leading into the end of this decade um, but lastly 
really kind of diverging a lot from you know uh, chart-based technical analysis is something relative to but china uh, here specifically is integrating the central bank's digital currency into its social credit system to shop at china's self-service grocery stores you'll need or you'll now need a minimum social credit score of 550 are you ready for this in europe and the usa it is coming probably within the next five years now um i've talked about this plenty of times in the past here um, in terms of like cbdc's centralized banking digital currencies but first off i just want to go ahead and play this video and that's not in english so i'm not going to have the sound on but what you can clearly see here is we have a man here pointing towards what is a grocery store you see this little qr code this ipad right here you're going to see it. it's going to scan his face it's going to run him through the social credit score that's you know relative to things like ESG's uh, uh, digital ID is going to be intertwined with blockchain um, based currencies specifically the CBDC's um, and if your social credit score isn't high enough um, like it said up here you you can't go you couldn't even go into the score you couldn't buy anything you basically you get shut off from society now if we go back to this video we see right here he was this is at the payment terminal where he's again having to have his face scan so you can buy not only did he have to have his face scan to go into the store but now he's having to scan his face in order to buy out of the store what he wants to buy so we can qr code face scanning device like for example like if you're in the u.s and you are somebody who goes to chick-fil-a often or goes to like somewhere like chipotle or uh, any sort of fast food restaurant that uses some sort of qr code based app that allows you to earn points and redeem free food this is all relative to this and is uh, uh, basically a precursor into something more complex than just you know uh, user data on a for example a chick-fil-a app that is connected to a certain number of points so you can get free food this in this case is going to like for example let's say you have a qr code on your phone that, that holds the data for your digital id so like your medical records your financial history and data etc so on and so forth you have to scan that before going into the grocery store or buying anything like he had to do but instead here he's scanning his face so it's even a little bit more advanced or personal than just a qr code on your phone now for whatever reason you're kind of skeptical to this even though like i clearly showed a video CBDCs are clearly something that the, the, the American government has talked about, uh, but I mean, here we have this article, China Watches Digital Yuan App, all you need to know, this was published September of last year, we can see um, here in the highlighted portions, but specifically, uh, I'm not really, I'm going to leave this article in the description, but it, what is an ECNY, is an ECNY a type of cryptocurrency, the value of an ECNY, can I buy ECNY, use using ECNY, talking about how the digital app works, the digital wallet works. Um, but one of the main things, like, for example, right, available to users in 23 cities across China, the app will enable millions of users to use the ENCNY, and then Tencent on WeChat partnered, then bringing it to 1.2 billion users. Um, although I quickly, I do want to, so an ENCY right here, also known as the digital yuan and officially called the digital currency electronic payment dc slash ep is a digitized version of china's legal currency the uh, renminbi rmb it is issued by china's central bank the people's bank of china it is designed mainly to be used for high frequency small scale uh, small scale retail purchases and transactions so the ecny is basically like i just said it's basically a type of cbdc uh, relative to the uh, People's Bank of China, as it said. Um, here's another article. This one goes back to May of 2021. China's new digital yuan wallet with fingerprint ID causes privacy worries. Um, and it's talking about like using biometrics. Like, for example, if you have an iPhone and you have your, back in the day with earlier iPhones, it was first, it was your thumb, thumbprint data, like it shows in this image here on the screen. Open up your phone, and then eventually we then had face ID, biometrics, you know, 
measure uh, analyzing our face in order to you know open up your phone and basically i mean all of these the, the companies you know the hardware devices that they give you such as like for example the apple and the iphone the android phones even your computers like laptops having webcams on them kind of the whole idea of like plenty of people myself included will you know put a piece of tape over a webcam so it's not sitting there and kind of like watching you in the background as i mentioned uh, this is all relative to the information that Edward Snowden um, released many years ago with respect to some sort of surveillance of uh, of, a, of a government uh, over its people, uh, clearly being done in China in many ways. But I, I wanted just wanted to touch on that too, to again, just kind of bring up the 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 bad side of where all of this cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain, you know, could be going. And unfortunately, my personal opinion seems that it is going to go down. Bitcoin, blockchain in general, could bring great things and is bringing great things to evolving, you know, society and peer-to-peer -peer interactions and in large scale, you know, intercontinental interactions, whether that's, you know, on a monetary basis through means of currencies and stores of values and financial exchange, but also on the level of things like NFTs and, and minting like land and blockchains, uh, something, you know, going back to, the, I know the metaverse died out and things like that, but the metaverse was really a precursor to something that I think blockchain, when it's a little bit more understood and it's a little bit more mature, will be better at doing. And uh, you can even think about things like, it's like I mentioned NFTs and like, for example, if you think about trading cards, so if you were to bring up just like baseball, football, trading cards, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Pokemon cards, all of these things are like, imagine, all of that slowly transitions to, I'm not saying the physical cards die out, but you know, they can obviously as a possibility, but like imagine where you like your Pokemon cards now aren't, you know, they're not mainly being bought through the stores as physical, you know, packages of cards. And now they're, you buy them, you know, online through the internet, you know, with cryptocurrency uh, or some stable coin. And now you have that minted, like each individual trading card is an NFT a non fungible token. It's it's similar to the the the, the um the transition from things like GameStop, where you people in the earlier days when con video game consoles and video games were coming out and being released, that they would go to, you would go to the store. I mean myself. I mean I remember doing this many times when I was younger. You'd go to the store to buy a physical or a physical disc, hard copy of a game. You'd bring it back to your house. You'd put it in manually. And you start to play the game, and then eventually, over a period of time, that transition to our now are the PS4s and the things like that. They have even that was on the PS3 as well. I mean, you could buy digital games on the PS3 too, but nowadays you just go into the the the, the game store that's built into the the console, and you can just digitally buy the game. You don't need to go anywhere. You don't need to go to GameStop anymore. And that's the same thing. Like if you think about like Best Buys, uh, and why. Realistically, all of this, the, the, the further digitization of society, which blockchain is going to propel and exponentiate, I think, to a degree that we haven't seen since really when the Internet first came out, we're, we're starting this digitization of society is furthering the functionalities of an of a, of a interconnected society, whether within a country or, you know, globally speaking, it's transitioning the peer-to-peer uh, -peer interactions from being physical fiat in person going to stores to buying things through the internet with digital currencies and uh, like also introducing like I said the metaverse and like virtual reality and buying land within the blockchain and things like that um, but anyways that was really all that I wanted to go over and talk about in this video so finally hopefully you enjoyed again none of this is financial advice this is really meant to be educational content in order to uh, provide the ability to learn and better your understanding knowledge etc information within the realm of trading cryptocurrency blockchain and what this what these things imply uh, going forward uh, within human society but all of that being said, again, hopefully you enjoyed, and I hope you were able to learn something. I hope you all have a blessed day.
forever such a long time long time is what we've been through you're all me